So hi and welcome to this NPTEL course uh, entitled Gender and Literature. So we've had a couple of introductory lectures already. So we'll start with the first text today, which is entitled Understanding Patriarchy by Bell Hooks. So it's an essay by Bell Hooks, which talks about the problems of patriarchy, the politics of patriarchy, and also the production of patriarchy. How was patriarchy produced uh, in different settings? So uh, the space becomes very important. The sites of production becomes very important. and. Uh, one of the many interesting things which this essay does, it, it sort of completely deconstructs the ontology of victimhood, right? So it, it deconstructs the entire binary between the abusive man and the passively suffering woman. And it, it looks at patriarchy as a more complex phenomenon, as something which affects men as well as women. And he, he looks at men as sufferers of patriarchy as well, even when they are perpetrators of patriarchy. So the whole uh, point between the perpetrator and the sufferer, that borderline blurs away uh, in this essay. So instead of a neat binary between the uh, you know, perpetrating men and the suffering women, we, we have instead a very complex phenomenon of patriarchy, which is uh, examined as a production, uh, you know, promotion and perpetuation of a certain kind of discursive apparatus. And patriarchy is seen over here as a discursive apparatus, uh, something which is uh, surreptitiously uh, performing, surreptitiously structured. You don't realize it is there. It's like any granulative. It just appears as a given, appears as a pre-discursive, meta-discursive quality, uh, as a non-construct, as something which is um, always already there. And that's the whole point of a granulative, that it must appear as a seamless given, as a seamless phenomenon, which is uh, non-discursive, non-constructed in quality. And now the other thing which this essay does, uh, among the many uh, interesting things, is that it looks at uh, what I mentioned in the previous lecture, the entanglement between textuality and experientiality, right? So uh, while doing gender studies, uh, we need to resist this, this tendency towards textuality uh, all the time because if you reduce everything to a text, then that takes away the experientiality of the phenomenon, right? And so what we're looking at ideally is a balance between textuality and experientiality and, and um, those of you who have done my course in culture studies would know that there's a very interesting book written by Jan Hacking uh, on exactly this subject, uh, it's called The Social Construction of What, where it's a critique of excessive constructionism, uh, it's a critique of this tendency towards excessive textualization of any phenomenon. Now, patriarchy over here in this essay is described as a discursive phenomenon, but equally as an experiential phenomenon, right? And, and there are very graphic descriptions of experiences. Uh, you know, described by Bell Hooks, where she talks about anecdotal evidence, anecdotal accounts of her own understanding, her own experience in patriarchy, uh, her brother's experience in patriarchy, her partner's experience in patriarchy, etc. The focus here, of course, is on American patriarchy. The setting is American, but it is sufficiently local, it's sufficiently generic and local uh, to be used as a model to understand patriarchy in different settings as well. Right, so what this essay offers us is a very interesting theory of the production of patriarchy, but also a very vivid and almost visceral experience uh, of patriarchy as an experience. So again, we, we're back to this entanglement between textuality and viscerality. It's a visceral phenomenon, something which you feel, something which you go through at a very uh, core embodied level. Uh, and at the same time, it's a discursive apparatus designed to promote, protect, perpetrate certain categories of uh, human beings, certain categories of production, Etc. Now, if you look at the opening sentence of this book, of uh, this essay, which is patriarchy is the single most life threatening social disease assaulting the male body and spirit in our nation. So, this should be on the screen at the moment, uh, the first sentence of this essay, where the definition of patriarchy takes up interestingly medical metaphors, right? So, the degree of medicalization of patriarchy that Hooks offers. So, quite clearly, uh, she looks at patriarchy as a Pathology is something which is a disease which suffers, which assaults the male body and spirit in our nation. And also notice uh, the site of victimhood over here, right? So quite clearly from the very inception, this essay is telling us that the victims of patriarchy are actually the men, the male body, because they're the ones who then become the perpetrators of patriarchy. But that perpetration takes place after they have been indoctrinized. So indoctrination, interpolation, these become part of the victimhood of patriarchy. They become victims of patriarchy through the process of indoctrination. And of course, they become 
bigger victims of patriarchy by being perpetrators of patriarchy, right? So again, we're looking at um, blurring of borderlines between the perpetration and the suffering uh, in the hands of patriarchy. So it's the single most life-threatening social disease assaulting the male body and spirit in our nation. Yet most men do not use the word patriarchy in everyday life. Most men never think about patriarchy, what it means, how it is created and sustained. So like any grand narrative, it is consumed unquestioningly. You don't sit back and have any ambivalence about patriarchy. We don't have this ambivalent understanding of patriarchy which would reveal it to be a construct. Right? And that's true for almost any grand narrative. In order to pass off as a grand narrative, it must masquerade as a given. It must masquerade as something which is just out there, always there, should not be questioned, etc. So there's, no, there's hardly any ambivalence when it comes to acknowledging patriarchy or acknowledging the effects of patriarchy, the adverse effect of patriarchy among men. Many men in our nation, uh, the nation over here being the United States, many men in our nation would not be able to spell the word or pronounce it correctly. So even at a very uh, superficial semantic level, the word patriarchy almost doesn't appear uh, in public discourses and debates about gender, debates about feminism, where there are other words which are used, there are other terms which are used, but there's, there's a tendency to resist the core problem and to not acknowledge the real problem. So there's a lot of talk about uh, male violence, a lot of talk about you know, women suffering the violence in, in the hands of men in households and domestic settings. But there's a degree of reluctance when it comes to addressing the real hardcore problems, which is patriarchy, because it's not unequivocally condemned. So because patriarchy has its benefits, patriarchy produces its rewards and benefits. So and there's no unequivocal critique of patriarchy, which is something which is missing, even the most uh, sophisticated feminist discourses. And what Hooks is saying over here is, as uh, new age feminists, as people who really want to engage at the level of gender dynamics, gender identity, one of the things we should do at, at the very outset is to define the problem, localize the problem, locate the problem in patriarchy, in the entire institution of patriarchy, in the entire modus operandi of patriarchy. So the word patriarchy just is not a part of their normal everyday thought or speech. So even rhetorically, even semantically, the word doesn't appear as often as it should. Uh, in any debate about gender, in a debate about feminism, uh, in a debate about masculine violence, etc. Men who have heard and know the word usually associate it with women's liberation, with feminism, and therefore dismiss it as irrelevant to their own experiences. Now, this is a very important sentence because what it does is, uh, to the common man, to the everyday, uh, to the every man in the street, the word patriarchy is axiomatically associated with feminism, with women's liberation, and these are things which they think do not relate to them. These are things which they think do not affect them. So it's very easy to dismiss the word patriarchy as being a uh, rhetorically reified category. It's something that academics do, something that you know, people who are feminists do, etc. So again, this divorce of feminism from the everydayness is a result of the refusal to acknowledge patriarchy. Right? So what Hooks is saying here is, if we are really to be feminists, if we really want to engage with the gender problem, we must make it, uh, we must bring it to the level of everydayness, because the gender dynamic, the gender difference, the, the gender discrimination uh, is actually operative at a daily level, not at a sophisticated academic level. Right? So to uh, associate the word patriarchy with some kind of a, uh, elegant, uh, elitist, feminist movement is a big disservice uh, to the entire cause of feminism, to the entire cause of gender politics uh, in general. So this is something which you need to do. We need to put patriarchy, uh, understand patriarchy at a ground level. How does it operate uh, in a domestic setting, in an intimate setting, in a household, uh, in a middle class home in America, etc. Right, so I have been standing at podiums talking about patriarchy for more than 30 years. Uh, it's a word I use daily and men who hear me often ask me what I mean by it. So it's one of those very common words where everyone knows it's there but no one quite understands what it means or what it connotes, right? And this lack of understanding is very strategic because there's a degree of refusal to engage with patriarchy at all because patriarchy is not always evil. Patriarchy can also be benevolent, patriarchy can be protective, patriarchy can take care of you, right? So to brand it as an unequivocal evil is a difficult thing to do, hence the reluctance to engage with patriarchy at a critical level, right? So when it comes to, later in the essay we'll find that when it comes to asking people, uh, is male violence bad? 
everyone would say yes, everyone would say yes, a male violence uh, against women is a bad thing, it should be stopped, etc. But if you extend the question and go to the real cause of male violence, and if you ask uh, the uh, related question, is patriarchy bad? Then the answer is not so, so unequivocal. It's more, there's a degree of hesitance, a degree of ambivalence in branding patriarchy as a necessarily bad thing. And that's a section that we will study in details as we move on. So nothing discounts the old anti-feminist projection of men as all-powerful more than a basic ignorance of a major facet of the political system that shapes and informs male identity and sense of self from birth until death. The second narrative, from birth until death, which is a narrative of indoctrination, a narrative of interpolation, uh, internalization. And again, when I use these words, internalization, indoctrination, of course, we need to be careful because uh, these happen at a very hardcore neural cognitive level as well as at an artificial discursive level. And this constant loop between the inside and the outside, how you think in your brain and how you consume the discursive apparatus outside you is something which we need to pay a lot of attention to when you're doing gender studies because the deity of gender studies is based on this consumption of the discursive apparatus around you, the subscription, the consumption, the indoctrination, which then informs the way you think. Uh, the very neural way in which thought process happen in your brain is actually determined discursively by your consumption of the discourses around you. So uh, one of the key things, one of the key categories in gender studies, uh, a category which we'll keep returning to through the various texts that we do is embodiment. And I think, I believe I've talked about embodiment in the previous lectures on culture studies as well, but we need to uh, reassert the importance of embodiment, embodiment in uh, feminist writings and gender studies, etc. And embodiment can be seen as a neural category, is the way you process your thought, is the process, is the way you behave with your body, etc. But also, I, my working definition of embodiment is that it's a form of navigation. It's the way you navigate with the discursive apparatus, it's the way you navigate with the environment. And of course, by environment, is, environment is a very complex category. So environment can be the natural environment, it can be the ideological environment, it can be the discursive environment, etc. So how do you navigate with it? Uh, at an embodied level, at a sartorial level, at a linguistic level, etc. Right? So embodiment becomes a very complex uh, performance uh, in more ways than one. So, uh, you know, we find that there's a lot of allusion to embodiment in this essay. The patriarchy demands a certain kind of embodiment, a certain kind of performance in embodiment, a certain kind of engagement with a discursive apparatus, right? So we need to locate and identify patriarchy and examine it as what it is. So from the time of birth until the time of death. It's like a one grand narrative on male domination, etc. But, but interestingly, what Hooks is saying is that we need to understand the ontology of privilege over here. Right? It's a very selective kind of privilege which is produced at different kinds of sites. And what this essay aims to do is that it, it aims to deconstruct the privilege and expose it as a pathology. Right? So it's not really a privilege, it's a pathology, it's a lack that needs to be understood, needs to be examined, uh, needs to be learned for what it is. So there's a degree of unlearning that needs to happen uh, when we are examining patriarchy. So men must unlearn the privilege and discover that to be a pathology, discover that to be a lack, which is something that informs patriarchal thought processes. So I often use the phrase imperialist, white supremacist, capitalist patriarchy. So look at all the adjectives which are combined together over here. Imperialist, white supremacist, capitalist patriarchy. So these are all the tautological extensions of patriarchy, imperialist, white, so there's a racial category of patriarchy as well, uh, supremacist, capitalist, etc. And of course, when we are doing any study of gender, race becomes a very important factor. So that's one of the reasons why we need to be careful by using the word feminism with a capital F. So, you know, it's very easy to brand feminism as a grand narrative, which then becomes the white woman's narrative, right? But then that sometimes does a disservice to some of the other feminist movements happening in some of the parts of the world where the entire ontology of agency is very different. So what is agency to a white, wealthy Manhattan woman might be very different from what is agency uh, to another woman in another part of the world which is economically less privileged uh, and racially more reified. Right? So we need to take these categories into consideration as well. Okay. So this is a phrase used by Hooks, imperialist, white supremacist, capitalist patriarchy to describe the interlocking political systems that are the foundation of our nation's politics. If you look at American politics, you find this is probably true for almost any kind of uh, historical situation, imperialist, white, expansionist, supremacist, capitalist patriarchy. So that's the whole point, that's the entire ontology of patriarchy at a political discursive level. 
of these systems, the one that we learn the most about growing up is a system of patriarchy, even if we never know the word, because patriarchal gender roles are assigned to us as children and we are given continual guidance about the ways we can best fulfill these roles. So the moment the word fulfill comes, we realize we're talking about conformity over here. Right? So it's a degree of conformity to certain codes. So patriarchy requires or entails production of certain codes, certain coded behavior. Right? So a large part of parenting, a large part of middle class parenting in America, and of course that can be said about many parts of the world as well, is about bringing up children uh, in a way that would make them conformist to certain kinds of codes of patriarchal behavior. Right? So how we can best fulfill those roles. And like any grand narrator, patriarchy also will reward you for conforming to those roles. So it will reward you with a value system, it will reward you tangibly uh, with material systems, etc. And we'll see a little later in the essay how the question of visibility, agency, they become very big when it comes to patriarchy. So if you're conforming to the courts consistently, then it become more visible, you become more agentic uh, as an individual, as an entity, as a self uh, in any patriarchal setting. Okay. So what is patriarchy? What's the working definition of patriarchy the Hooks is offering over here? And this is what she says. Patriarchy is a political social system that insists that males are inherently dominating, superior to everything and everyone deemed weak, especially females, and endowed with the right to dominate and rule over the weak and to maintain the dominance through various forms of psychological terrorism and violence. So it's a very loaded definition of patriarchy where the word violence comes, the word terrorism comes, uh, the word empowerment comes, etc. But the operative thing for us for the purpose of this particular course is that it's the system which insists that males are inherently dominating. And if you look at it very carefully, we find this is an irrational insistence. It's actually not rational at all. Right? But the irrationality of patriarchy is disguised completely. And then what we have instead is a degree of rationalization of this kind of an existence, right? So it's a completely spurious rationalization. It's a form of rationality which is created, artificially engineered, you might say, uh, in order to create the system uh, of production, perpetuation, and promotion of certain kind of behavior, right? So like any grand narrative, uh, it is actually rational in quality, but then that irrationality is effaced away. And what we have instead is a different order of rationality, which then makes it, which masquerades and eventually becomes a pre-discursive given. You don't even question that as a discourse. You don't even discover its discursivity, right? And that discovery of discursivity is important because the moment you discover its discursivity, then you begin to question it as a construct. And then the whole point of deconstruction begins from there. When, you, when you're able to recognize something as a construct, then you're able to deconstruct it. That's the next natural step is deconstruction. However, if, you, if you're not able to recognize it as a construct, if it appears to be a pre-discursive uh, given, then obviously it becomes difficult to deconstruct it. So the whole point of patriarchy, like any grand narrative, is to efface away its constructed quality, uh, its irrationality, and instead you know, impose an order of rationality, an order of um, you know, hegemony, which you know, does away with any, any possibility of questioning. Right? And what does it want? What does it aspire to, to create? What is it designed to do? It's designed to uh, you know, entail or facilitate dominance over the weak, dominance through psychological terrorism and violence. Now, we'll see in, as I said, the very ontology of violence uh, is uh, problematized. It's not just violence at a physical level. Uh, it's not just about beating up people corporeally. So there's also psychological violence. It's also about fear. It's also about a value-added system which will tell you that you should be scared, you should be fearful if you're not obeying certain rules. And of course, as you know, uh, those of us who read Althusa would know that this is most rampant with certain apparatus, the ideological state apparatus, the repressive state apparatus, ISA and the RSA. And at a very micro level, the, perhaps the first ISA is a family where a child is born, uh, the value system in which a child is brought up, right, which, which indoctrinates the child into consuming certain kind of codes. Uh, and then there's a value added quality to those codes. If you consume those codes, if you're an obedient child, if you're conforming to those codes, you're rewarded uh, materially, tangibly, intangibly, etc. And that is the whole point, is the whole discourse of, uh, which is designed uh, for patriarchal promotion. 
and the converse is true as well. If you are non-conformist, if you are subversive, if you are a recalcitrant child, mm -hmm. then obviously you are uh, punished uh, in different degrees. The punishment could be psychological, the punishment could be corporeal, the punishment could be uh, happening at the level of the body, when the body of the child is confined and contained and coerced into becoming a conformist. But equally, it can also create psychological terrorism. Uh, and it's a very interesting word that Hooks is using. Now, we find, when you read the essay, that the whole point of terrorism, the whole point of trauma uh, in this essay is problematized. The very ontology of trauma is problematized. And there's a reference to PTSD uh, in the essay, post-traumatic stress disorder. Now, when you hear the word PTSD, we think of Vietnam, we think of the war sites, we think of Iraq, we think of something which happens to war veterans uh, in battlefields and people fight and kill each other with very sophisticated weapons. However, this is a refreshingly radical thing that this essay offers. It says, in order to be traumatized, you don't necessarily have to go to a war zone. Trauma can happen even inside your family. Trauma can happen even in an intimate space, the most domestic intimate space, mm -hmm. which can then be dramatically defamiliarized and then become a battleground uh, of contestation, a battleground for different kinds of conflicts, etc., which can you know, create and generate a residual trauma which might become permanent in quality. So the entire ontology of trauma, the entire site of trauma is defamiliarized in this essay, as you'll see in a moment. Right. Uh, so psychological terrorism and violence have become very big factors in patriarchy. And now there is an anecdotal evidence that the Hooks is offering here. When my older brother and I were born with a year separating us in age, patriarchy determined how we, sh we would each be regarded by our parents. So in a, as, as a household, a common middle class household, where a girl child and a boy child are born with one year separating them. However, what is very quickly evident is the way uh, the difference in upbringing is very rampant, uh, the way the girl child is brought up and the way the boy child is brought up. And also, uh, things uh, as apparently innocuous as toys uh, become very, very gendered in quality. So we find the reference to a marble game that happens in this essay uh, very, very soon. And marble game is supposed to be something that boys play with. And we have an instance over here where the girl is, is better at the marble game than the boy is, and that becomes uh, a cause for discomfort to the parents because that's not something the way it is normally designed as a narrative. Now, what we have here is uh, a compulsory production of normativity uh, that happens in the family. And that compulsory production of normativity is something which is very important for patriarchy to be operative in the first place. Now, what happens when a child, uh, innocently or otherwise or deliberately, questions this compulsory production of normativity, questions normativity. Uh, then a the child obviously is beaten. And we have a very graphic and very disturbing scene of child abuse described over here when a girl child is beaten uh, by the very controlling and uh, authoritative father figure, which very quickly becomes a symbolic scene uh, of the female child being beaten by the phallocentric figure. So it's a very local, micro, real scene, but also equally becomes a very symbolic scene of the father figure beating and abusing and chastising the female child for not obeying the patriarchal discourse, for not obeying the, or conforming to the courts of patriarchal behavior. In other words, uh, not being a participant or a consumer in this compulsive production of normativity. Okay, so how is this normativity produced? How are the different discourses of normativity uh, generated and determined? Both our parents believed in patriarchy. They had been taught patriarchal thinking through religion. So we know the religion obviously historically has been used uh, very conveniently and very effectively by patriarchy, by uh, the figures of authority, etc., which is more often than not collusive with religion. Right? So religion and uh, patriarchy, religion, and almost all religions are patriarchal in quality. The language of religions are patriarchal in quality. So there are religious texts uh, which were historically once upon a time uh, forbidden to be read by women because those language would just be you know, accessed by men. Those languages were just uh, you know, given to men to be read, to be recited, to be debated upon, and women were forbidden uh, you know, directly uh, from reading those particular scriptures. So we know religion uh, has been quite hand in glove with patriarchy from the very historical origins of the institution. Almost all religions are patriarchal in quality, so religion becomes a very handy instrument uh, to produce, uh, promote, and perpetuate patriarchy. And we see over here that what Hooks is offering is a typical uh, American South uh, the American southern household, middle class household, uh, which believes in God uh, in a very biblical way. Uh, and that kind of a biblical belief system very quickly becomes and extends onto a patriarchal system uh, in a non-religious space as well. So how does religion become an instrument of patriarchy? How does religion become an Althusian ISA? 
ideological state apparatus. And this is how, uh, as Hooks describes it, at church, they had learned that God created man to rule the world and everything in it. And it was a work of woman to help men perform these tasks, to obey and to always assume a subordinate role in relation to a powerful man. So from the very inception, from the very genesis uh, of religion, uh, in a biblical genesis, or you know, the very beginning of religion, we find that more often than not, it's a man uh, who is the centerpiece of creation. And if you look at the book of Genesis and Bible that has been alluded to over here, and that is God created men and then to uh, give company to men, you know, he created, uh, and God of course is he, he created woman uh, as someone who is secondary and subordinate to man in terms of helping man to carry out different roles. So from the very inception we find patriarchy is embedded historically in the rhetoric of religion, uh, in the way religion is sort of created, designed, engineered and consumed. Uh, in different forms, in, in churches, and textbooks, and translations, etc. So the job of the woman is to obey and to always assume a subordinate role in relation to a powerful man. So power is localized, power rests with the man, and it's a woman's job to help power continue by being subordinate to it. They were taught that God was male. Of course, there's no surprise to say God was male, and the pronoun which is used for God in the Bible and most scriptures that we're aware of uh, is a he pronoun, a male pronoun. These teachings were reinforced in every institution they encountered, schools, courthouses, clubs, sports arenas, as well as churches. So again, these are classic sites of uh, ideological apparatus where you know, this kind of discursivity uh, is designed, produced, promoted and protected. Uh, you know, schools, clubs, sports arenas. Uh, sports arenas are very interesting because sports arenas, we find that um, th those become very important sites for some kind of hyper-masculinity, hyper-patriarchy to be operative. Where if you're not masculine enough in certain sports arenas, uh, you are not just chastised, you're rejected, you're abandoned, you're punished, uh, sometimes bodily, sometimes corporeally. The sports becomes a very important side of study uh, for those of us interested in gender and the relationship between gender and identity, the production of identity. Okay, so embracing patriarchal thinking, like everyone else around them, they taught it to their children because it seemed like a natural way to organize life. So the, the adjective natural and the verb organize is very important way yeah. To design a narrative, a narrative of normativity. Uh, it's very important that this kind of a patriarchal behavior, this kind of patriarchal belief system is naturalized. So naturalization and normativization happen uh, together in this kind of a setting. So naturalizing an irrational discourse uh, by making it appear as the most rational thing to do is part of how normativity takes place. It's part of how um, something as absurd uh, as white man's superiority is believed and consumed and subscribed to. Now, if you look at the history of patriarchy in almost any setting, uh, one of the uh, most classic examples of the alliance of patriarchy in politics is imperialism. Right? If you look at European imperialism, uh, which was basically a white man's supremacy narrative, uh, which was created to different kinds of ways, so not just the white man coming and beating up the non-white men, but also the white man creating an education system which helped promote the supremacy uh, of the white man. So part of the education system of the colonies, as you know by now, was largely experimental, uh, was largely designed in order to protect and perpetrate the white man's superiority. So you grew up consuming the white man's literature, you grew up consuming the white man's narrative of greatness, and then you become a consensual consumer. Uh, you, you, you offer your consent uh, to the entire ethos of imperialism. You, you believe it to be a good thing. You believe it to be a rescue mission as a native. And if, you, if imperialism manages to do that, then obviously that's the highest form of success. You don't run a military, you don't require a military presence after that at all. Uh, if you make people into, uh, you know, consensual consumers, why would they need a military at all? They, they're very happy uh, to be a subordinate, they're very happy to be second fiddle uh, to the white man's superiority. So, you know, we find patriarchy over here, uh, when it happened with imperialism, in the case of imperialism, it happened very directly through military, uh, through mercantile inventions, etc., but also most repetitiously through schools, to education system, to religious transformations, to religious conversions, etc., where you know patriarchy was operative in most repetitious and perhaps uh, more sophisticated ways. So, what happens to, to a daughter, to a female child, in such a you know conventional, conservative, patriarchal household? As their daughter, I was taught that it was uh, uh, my role to serve, to be weak, to be free from the burden of thinking, to caretake and nurture others. My brother was told it was his role to be served, to provide, to be strong, to think, strategize and plan and to refuse to caretake or nurture 
others. We see a very clear and blunt binary in operation over here. So the girl child is taught to be the nurturer, they should play with dolls, they should play with kitchen utensils, etc. And we find very quickly over here the politics of toy, the politics of possessing toy, artifacts, it becomes very complex and gendered and discursive very quickly. So the, the brother, the male child, is given guns and marbles and cars to play with, whereas the girl child is expected to be the nurturer, so she's pushed into the kitchen space, even at a proxy level, even at the level of toys, even at a ludic space. So even a ludic space of play becomes very discursive in quality when it comes to patriarchy. And play, as I mentioned, is a very discursive phenomenon. So, you know, when you do something like gender studies, you realize that even as, you know, seemingly innocuous activities such as games, plays, the plays, the games that children play, uh, they are very, very patriarchal in quality. They're very, very gendered in quality in terms of the embeddedness of gender into the way the narratives work. Okay, so my brother was taught that it was his role to be served. So he was expected to be waited upon uh, as a male child, uh, to provide, to be strong, to think, strategize, and plan and to refuse to or caretake to nurture others. I was taught, the female child, I was taught that it was not proper for a female to be violent. It was unnatural. So this uh, equation between men and natural violence uh, is a very handy tool of patriarchy because men are supposed to be strong to go out there, conquer the world, you know, invade, territorialize, uh, help in expansionist plans, etc. So if you start from a very micro level at the very inception where male children are taught to be violent that it's good to be uh, benevolently violent it's good to be violent in a good way in a value added way right so when you when you go and become violent in a way the society wants you to be violent right so that's a good thing as a male child and obviously as a female child you're taught the opposite you shouldn't be violent at all it's unnatural of you to be violent as a female child so my brother was taught that his value would be determined by his will to do violence, albeit in appropriate settings. So obviously the, the boy child can't be violent against his own parents, uh, but he should be able to exert violence when need be in a different setting, right? In appropriate settings. So space, society of violence becomes very important. He was taught that for a boy, enjoying violence was a good thing, albeit in appropriate settings. He was taught that a boy should not express feelings. I was taught that girls could and should express feelings, or at least some of them. So again, feelings become, emotions become very, very gendered in quality. And we know the very Eurocentric division of the mind and the body, the rationality and the irrationality uh, are very, very gendered in quality. So if you look at the classic Cartesian theorem, I think therefore I am. So it's not really a pronouncement of the entire humanity. It's a pronouncement on the white man's thinking. Right? So it's the enlightenment white male thinking and therefore becoming. So I think therefore I am is a white man that the Eurocentric way of becoming, the Eurocentric uh, epistemological becoming, true knowledge, true consciousness, uh, true formation in the, in the brain. It's a very exclusive phenomenon. It's not really um, inclusive in the sense that it doesn't talk about women, it doesn't talk about the non-white people in general as well. So these are very localized theorems which were conveniently made generalized and macro narratives uh, you know, of you know, thought processes, enlightenment, etc. So he was taught that a boy should not express feelings. I was taught that a girl sh could and should express feelings, or at least some of them. When I responded with rage at being denied a toy, I was taught as a girl in a patriarchal household that rage was not an appropriate feminine feeling, uh, that it should not be, not be expressed, but be eradicated. So not only should it not express rage, but it should eradicate rage. And again, look at the value-added quality to these kind of teachings. So you're a good girl if you manage to eradicate or efface away rage. And you're a good boy if you can be violent when the, when the situation demands violence from you. Right? So the value-added quality is very, very important. And of course, you're rewarded to conform to these value systems tangibly as well as intangibly. You're rewarded and you're punished, again, tangibly and intangibly for being uh, recalcitrant to carry out those uh, codes. Okay, when my brother responded with rage at being denied a toy, he was taught as a boy in a patriarchal household that his ability to express rage was good, but that he had to learn the best setting to unleash his hostility. Right? So it has to be in a proper place. You can't be hostile against your own parents. You can't be hostile in a domestic setting. But in a world out there, if someone denies you your rights, it's perfectly within your rights to hit back as a male and demand what you think is your own, what you think you rightfully possess. Okay. It was not good for him to use his rage to oppose the wishes of his parents. But later, when he grew up, he was taught that rage was permitted and that allowing rage to provoke him to violence would help him protect home, 
uh, nation. And again, look at the very easy extensions which are happening, home and nation, right? So protecting the home becomes a proxy of protecting the nation. So every male, every able male uh, should be strong enough to protect the dignity of the home, protect the security of the home uh, through expression of rage, through expression of violence, through unleashing of selective and strategic hostility. And the same kind of unleashing would be useful and effective when it comes to protecting the nation. So we find these institutions, these sites, home, nation, etc., they become so patriarchally embedded in quality in terms of the desired behavior for protection and promotion and perpetuation. So we'll end at this point today and we'll continue with this lecture in the uh, coming lectures to come. Thank you for your attention.